Next, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome our keynote speaker for this morning, General Brian Fenton, Fenton Commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command. General Fenton currently serves as the 13th Commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command headquartered at MacDill Air Force Base, which oversees all special operations for the U.S. Department of Defense. Prior to assuming the command of U.S. SOCOM, General Fenton served as the commander of the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC, at Fort Liberty, North Carolina. General Fenton's other general officer assignments include senior military assistant for two U.S. Secretaries of Defense, deputy commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command, Pacific, and deputy commanding general, uh, general operations. General Fenton's key army and special operations assignments include Director of Operations of the Joint Special Operations Command, Brigade, Battalion, and Squadron Command, multiple overseas task force commands, and assignments as Detachment Commander and Operations Officer in 1st Battalion and 7th Special Forces Group Airborne. Please give a warm applause and welcome General Fenton and thank you again for being with us this morning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, first thing I've got to do is I'm not really as mean as that picture might make me look. I hope. <laughs> might have just been a bad day in the uh, in the organization. Uh, Dr. Farhardy, thank you uh, very much for that introduction. Appreciate you keeping it uh, short. We could probably go even shorter. I'll do a chat GPT version that maybe just has one sentence in it. Um, to President Law, Rhea Law, I know if she's not here, uh, Prasant, and uh, Frank McKenzie, the entire GNSI team, thank, thanks for having us today. Your SOCOM team very much appreciates an opportunity to come to audiences just like this and have these type of discussions and these type of conversations. So we're really grateful that we were invited. At uh, U.S. Special Operations Command, or SOCOM for short, we talk a lot about our Tampa family, or La Familia, as we like to refer to it. And you all here and many others that may be listening right now are a part of that. And it's great to be on this campus and among these ranks, and certainly after a great basketball win last night that I echo uh, provost that uh, we're this close getting into the NCAA, and we're really excited as well over at SOCOM. So you probably heard a big cheer coming from McDill. And this community has fostered a great uh, teammateship, uh, as we like to think about it here, in the greater Tampa, St. Pete, and Clearwater area, or otherwise known as Champa Bay. That's welcomed military members, past and present, and their families so very warmly. So we're really grateful to continue to be part of an incredible community. And we've also enjoyed a great partnership with USF, cooperating on research in areas critical to our SOCOM team and to national security. And venues like this conference, especially focused on strategic competition, are extremely important. Academia, government, and industry all coming together in a way that we might call an idea factory, an idea factory for good, fueled by multidisciplinary approaches to problem solving, focused on tangible outcomes, and many others that would end up being end states we should all achieve and endeavor to aspire to. So with all that at top of mind, I'd like uh, all of us again to give a round of applause to the GNSI team and USF for this great conference and this very, very important work. So if I could get a round of applause for them. Now, a mentor of mine, and a few of you here might have heard of him, a guy named Lou Holtz. And if there are Notre Dame fans in the audience, don't be embarrassed. You could raise your hand. Um, used to say, upon giving remarks in an audience just like this, he'd say 10% of you won't remember 10% of what I said 10 minutes after I said it. Nonetheless, for the next 90 minutes, I'm just kidding. I thought Frank... <laughs> Frank's ready to fall out of his seat there. Everybody had a breath. Uh, like. In fact, that wasn't my idea about the 90 minutes. It was chat GPTs. It was actually the AI that recommended 90 minutes so I could in 
cover this topic adequately. However, you're in luck because at SOCOM, we've long held and held a motto that says humans are more important than hardware. And lately we've been able to add and software and chat GPT and perplexity and Dolly. So we always keep a human in a loop to override those kind of recommendations. So this, this uh, morning I'll override that recommendation and try to do three things in short order. First, tell you a bit about who we are and what we do, because many of you may know SOCOM, but there may be a few out here that are less familiar with your special operations forces. Next, we'll share about a little about what we're seeing in terms of the challenges that I am absolutely positive and sure about were discussed yesterday. And then lastly, we'll end with how we're transforming at Special Operations Command to meet those challenges. So first, a little bit about what we do. Your SOCOM team is headquartered just down the road in South Tampa at MacDill Air Force Base. And our command's over 70,000 personnel strong, responsible for every special operations in our U.S. military. It's a joint force made up of uniformed and incredible civilian teammates. And that includes our Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Rangers, Marine Raiders, Air Commandos, and Space Guardians as of very recently. As well as our team of experts on intelligence, communications, logistics, data, psychological operations, human resources, and many, many more. And your special operations team operates in all domains. I like to say it's from seabed to space and cyber to fiber and everything in between. And we're across the globe in over 80 countries every single day across 24 time zones with 6,000 of our men and women, uniformed and civilians, deployed overseas as we speak this very morning. And we're doing some of the nation's most sensitive missions, crisis response, counterterrorism, and great power or strategic competition. And fundamental to us achieving success in those missions is our work with teammates just like are seated in front of us today and probably out on video conference. Work with industry, academia, allies, and international partners, and many more. And since we have some industry folks in the audience today, I thought I would just talk a little bit about what the SOCOM product is. And I'd say the SOCOM product for this nation is successful national security outcomes in the most politically sensitive and challenging environments and winning each and every time. And continuing with that analogy, I'd tell you that we have three business lines to get that product into the right place and do it successfully. First is great power or strategic competition. That's essentially pushing back and competing with the People's Republic of China and against Russia's, Russia's coercive activities and aggression. And we do this alongside and with generational relationships with international and U.S. government partners and allies. The second business line is counterterrorism, one SOCOM is known far and wide for, and continuing to assure that violent extremist organizations don't metastasize or present a threat to our homeland, our allies, and partners. And that includes organizations like ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab. And our third business line is responding to crisis worldwide, no notice, executing a sacred obligation to rescue U.S. citizens who may be hostages or recover our diplomats who may be under duress anywhere in the world. Using these three lines and against that very desired national security outcome, we work every day to prevent great power conflict and to prepare the environment in the event of a conflict of someone else's making so that our joint force can prevail if called upon. And on top of that, and all the while, we also work through our crisis response and counterterrorism lens to preserve strategic focus for this nation against the national defense priorities as set out for us by the Secretary of Defense. So the takeaway is that your special operations team provide options, creative, tailorable, irregular, and asymmetric for our senior leaders. 
while at the same time creating dilemmas and challenges for any adversary or competitor that wishes to oppose us. So now I'd like to tell you briefly about what we're seeing in our teammates deployed around the world. So at this moment, very apparent to everyone here, the rules-based international order that's been in place since World War II faces significant challenges from Russia to the PRC, from Hamas to the Houthis, and from Iran to North Korea, and many more. And our rivals and foes seek to divide and weaken the United States and allies and partners. In fact, we're facing what we refer to as waves of consequential challenges. And these waves remind me of something that not only I, but I'm sure you have seen in nature. Waves of consequence, as they're called. They are usually arrive in many places across the world in the wintertime. And I know in Tampa, we have two seasons. We've got summer and hot summer. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the winter, so go with me on this one. So in the winter, as many of you know, powerful winds sweep across the ocean. And they surge the water columns with such endurance, with such energy that they produce waves of enormous proportion. Waves seen only in places like South Pacific or Hawaii or Portugal. And they're massive, they're intense, and they're thundering. So much so that they're called by folks that dare to ride them waves of consequence because of the power and the speed and what they can deliver in terms of good or bad outcomes. And those waves, and I'm familiar with those from six plus years in Hawaii, remind me of the challenges we see right now to the rules-based order. Waves such as what we're seeing with the People's Republic of China, asserting its military power in the Indo-Pacific, while it coerces other nations around the world through economic and diplomatic pressures, the like of which we've seen as intellectual property theft, bribes, predatory investment strategies, and their own use of private security companies that we like to call private spurious companies, because they mean no good to anyone except the PRC. And then there's Russia's brazen, unprovoked, and illegal invasion of Ukraine now in its third year, creating the largest land war in Europe since World War II, with thousands of innocent men, women, and children affected. Carnage our world hasn't seen in decades and thought we would never see again. And outside of Europe, we've seen Russia's private military companies, or as we like to say, private malicious companies, doing the same ill will and untoward things in other nations outside of Europe, all for the Russian Federation, engaged across Africa and elsewhere to meddle in weak and unstable nations, extracting resources and generating instability. And both of these waves carry global information operations that create misinformation, untruths, and unrest. And then there's another wave, state actors like Iran, continuing to destabilize their regions. In fact, Iranian-sponsored Houthis continue to disrupt shipping lanes, causing lasting implications for the global economy, providing weapons and, in some instances, guidance on how to operate against the U.S. and partners and allies in the gray zone. And then there are some smaller but consistent waves remaining ever-present and they can be seen as violent extremist organizations. And while the physical caliphate, the land domain, sought by groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda is contained today in a way that we're not complacent about and remain vigilant on, their ideology, extremist ideology, is still unconstrained as it runs over the internet. And just when you think that's enough, there's one more wave very appropriate for the conference today. It's a wave of tech, smaller, faster, cheaper, more kinetic, more lethal. That's changing the character of warfare. And we're seeing it in the democratization of uncrewed systems and robotics in the air, the sea, undersea, and on the ground. Ubiquitous surveillance tools like biometrics and cameras and sensors of every kind in cities, 
and in places that used to be for monitoring and repressing citizens of autocratic regimes has now spread to the Western world. And of course, there's artificial intelligence, and it enables all the above, and it's game changing. And our foes are leveraging artificial intelligence, AI, in various ways. We've watched the PRC use AI to augment cyber attacks, support economic espionage, and assist in the development of what they call system destruction warfare, where their goal is to destroy weak points in ours and partner and ally systems across domains with targets such as network connections and satellites and logistical supply systems. And then the Russian military and the Russian Federation are also using large language models and those tools to conduct reconnaissance of satellite capabilities to support their operations in a cyber and space domain. And we've also seen North Korea and Iran use AI to assist in their cyber attacks and cryptocurrency theft. And none of these, none of these applications cares about an ethical approach or anything rooted in democratic values because they don't have to and they don't want to, but we do. All of this and probably waves I didn't even discuss can be very unsettling. But just like out in the ocean, Every once in a while, there's a rare breed that braves these mammoth waves and not only braves them, but looks at them as opportunities to be mastered and uses these challenges in a very unique way. These individuals or these groups possess the courage, the mindset, the creativity, the tenacity, and the skill to ride these immense mountains of water or challenges as we see in the rules-based order today. And daring to ride them means seeing these challenges, much like the big wave riders that do it out in the ocean, as opportunities to be mastered and conquered. Opportunities that call for partners of consequence to go against the waves of consequence. And that's just what I see seated here today and I'm sure out on video conference. Partners like academia, government, and industry, all here to talk through the challenges of great power or strategic competition and all that that entails in the tech space and to tackle them along with your SOCOM team. These partnerships of consequence to address the changing character of war are required to master and challenge these waves presented by adversaries and competitors that each and every day look to compete and present us with dilemmas or challenges of our own. And these partnerships give us an opportunity to alter the tactics and reshape the landscape, either of conflict or in competition or crisis, to our advantage, advantage to team democracy. But it can't be done without partnering with academia, industry, and international teammates, to name but a few. In fact, you'll see your SOCOM team in sessions just like this, preparing to master or ride those waves of consequence with our partners. And every year in May here in Tampa, we run a conference we call Special Operations Week or Soft Week. It's gone on for years. Many of you know it. Many of you may have taken part. And this year, the theme for that is global problems deserve a global soft network hard problems and hard places. And it's our opportunity to reinforce that partnerships just like this, and the ones that you've built and the ones that you're a part of, are important to master the challenges as I've just laid out. And tech and how we are transforming will be a key part of that soft week. So this brings me to my final point. At SOCOM, we don't just embrace these changes or these challenges, we ride them. We think we drive them. We think we're pathfinders and trailblazers as part of the Department of Defense for them. Because from our earliest of days in developing satellite communications for MANPAC portable application for our special operators on the ground to the modern day application of artificial intelligence, your special operations senses 
operational problems and looks to develop solutions along with partnerships just like this. And many of those solutions then spread into the rest of our joint force to assist our teammates in their missions across the continuum of competition, crisis, and conflict. And we know that technology, like many things, evolves, and that change is inevitable. And what triumphs today may falter tomorrow. And what keeps us winning may not be the same recipe as we need for tomorrow. But for us, we all resonate at the SOCOM team with one thing. Our competitive and comparative advantage is our people. They are what make us unique because they're naturally discerning. They're critical thinkers. They're especially recruited, assessed, selected, and trained to be proactive problem solvers. And when we talk about our people, we always end with our comparative and competitive advantage because we will wrap everything else around them in order for them to take us to the success I laid out as our product for the nation. So when we talk about transforming, we actually start with our people. And then we add tech, and then we add organizations. And tomorrow, I know people will be on your mind as you have a panel focused on the workforce of the future, a very important and key part of where we will all go in the challenges I described. And that hits at the heart of the SOCOM team, because if we have one more dollar to spend in Special Operations Command, We'll spend it on our people because transforming for the future, in our estimation, starts with investing in our people, in education, in workforce development, and at some point in utilizing the technology that we all so much crave. Having a skilled, innovative, and creative workforce, specifically building digital fluency and technologists as well. And in terms of tech and AI, that will really be important for your special operations team. Because we are data rich. We don't have data lakes. We have data oceans. From terabytes to petabytes to extabytes to zettabytes, we want to crush that data for decision and position advantage to deliver the successful product time and time again. We also want to do it to reduce cognitive load on the analyst and the warfighter while increasing the speed and precision to give an advantage to our tactical commanders. And your SOCOM team is, in essence, riding this wave by using data and artificial intelligence right now to produce dilemmas for our adversaries in competition, in crisis, and if it comes, in conflict. Seeing and sensing targets at a more precise level and enabling our joint force to see, sense, and strike anywhere in the globe as the Secretary of Defense reminds us about. And we're capitalizing on digital intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance because we know that there are mammoth mountains of publicly available and open source data that we're all tapping into today. And then using all of that as a data-centric approach to how we address the potential for conflict. And you'll see the SOCOM team pioneering new tools and capabilities such as generative AI, and autonomous and remotely crewed systems. Looking at affordable mass, one person and the many of many's in these uncrewed systems. And researching into applications as far and wide as nano and biotech. All of that to give us an advantage against any adversary or competitor. At the same time, we're also developing our talent and our data access and our architectures to take full advantage and leverage both the oceans and the mountains of data as I just described. So that may be far from the movies about Special Operations Command that you're familiar with, and that's okay. That's a part of what we do at the SOCOM headquarters that really is the business end of managing this entire incredible enterprise. And we're committed to it, but we're also committed to developing AI and autonomy in a responsible way in an ethical way to ensure it's trusted and reliable and in accordance with our Department of Defense policies. The last part of how we're transforming is how we're organized. We are willing to shape shift and change who we are 
in order to address and be successful at our nation's problems. I imagine that's much akin to the industry, because if you're not willing to do that at some day, you may not exist. You may not be relevant. And we certainly, certainly don't want that to be the case for Special Operations Command. So transforming in terms of people, technology, and organization is absolutely at the heart of what Special Operations Command is doing. In all of these, we see potential impact of the waves that we have, as I described in the challenges, from our team rooms to our boardrooms. It's making us a different organization than we were a, sh a few short years ago. So I'll wrap up with this. I know Deputy Secretary Hicks asked you to consider how your expertise, how this audience and those you represent can help make a difference. So along those lines, I'll just ask one thing of everybody here. If you're in academia, talk to somebody like me. If you're in government, talk to somebody in industry. And if you're in industry, well, just talk to everybody because we need those synapses and those connective tissues to occur. Talk about what you're doing, what you're seeing, what you're up to, because it might just create that partnership and a winning solution against those waves of consequence. Waves of consequence, as I said earlier, that require partnerships of consequence, just like this. And I might add that probably start at conferences of consequence, like the one we're in today. So thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, share some thoughts with you. I certainly look forward to seeing the results of this conference and any notes that can help your Special Operations Command team I look forward to seeing all at Special Operations Week. If you can come back to Tampa and have a great conference.